Welcome, everyone. Um, I first want to um, just explain that there's been a slight schedule change. If you look at the program, um, the, the folks on the um, uh, psychedelics and uh, war trauma a panel very kindly agreed to switch with us because one of our panelists has to rush to the airport. So I will ask you to please stay after this session because they have a great lineup and they've been very gracious in letting us go ahead of them. So um, with that, I'd like to uh, like to start um, our, our panel and, uh, and talk about um, the topic at hand. Um, will chatbots replace ra rabbis? So from an early age, Jews are taught to question everything. But um, the, not every rabbi is a good teacher, and every Jew does not have their own rabbi, and they might not have access to or want to go to a yeshiva, which is the Jewish term for a house of study. So how in the modern world do Jews, who call themselves the people of the book, keep the Torah alive? So. There's something called the Oral Torah, which consists of a bunch of statues and legal interpretations that were handed down at the same time, but not recorded, as the Book of Moses. And this holistic um, Jewish code of contact, conduct encompasses a wide swath of rules governing every aspect of life from um, marital relations to agricultural practices um, and civil claims and damages. It's a moral and legal code that Jews live by. So this was passed down orally for generations and generations until its contents were finally committed to the written word after the destruction of the sec Second Temple in 70 CE. The major repository of the Oral Torah are the Mishnah and the Gemara, and these are a, a series of running debates and commentaries that together form what is called the Talmud, something that you may have heard of. And this is the preeminent text of Rabbinic Judaism. And the special thing about the Talmud is that it has always made room for lots of dissenting opinions. Um, and um, it has allowed Judaism to adapt over time as new ethical um, issues crop up um, in the modern world. So the, the transmission of these laws um, and the descending opinions have also adapted with time, moving from oral to books to the internet and now generative AI. Um, so thanks to virtual Havruta, which we're going to hear about in a few minutes, um, people all over the world will have the option of turning to a chatbot with religious questions rather than simply asking their local rabbi. It's kind of the digital equivalent of having a study buddy. So this entrepreneurial project is worth examining for a number of reasons. It's serving as a test case for the application of something called domain-specific LLM-based retrieval augmented generation, which is a big mouthful, but it's, it's called RAG technology for short. And RAG technology is trying to find a way to rein in generative AI and stop it from hallucinating um, so that companies and people using generative AI can actually depend um, on the answers and know that they're correct. So um, the technical gaps of RAG are being explored as part of this project and you know, could have a wider impact on the use of AI. And as we will hear, the project also achieves um, an amazing feat of bringing together the three, I would say, opposing <laughs> branches of Judaism, um, reform, conservative, and orthodox. Um, and rather than just spitting out a, an answer to a question, like a, a search engine, um, the, the, um, the chatbot acts as a sparring partner and outlines how each branch of Judaism would answer a particular question and then proposes relevant links for people to study from there and then form their own opinion. So, as Steffi said, to, here to tell us about this, we have Antoine Leboye, who is a former board member of Geneva's, Geneva's liberal synagogue 
and he's currently managing director of the Software and AI uh, Venture Lab at uh, Munich's Technical University. And Lev Israel, who is chief product officer at Safari, which is a nonprofit organization that compiles an open source digital library of Jewish text. And I think it's worth mentioning that, he, that Lev is actually a trained rabbi, but rather than... I'm a chatbot. <laughs> and a not, not a chatbot, but he's a trained rabbi who, um, rather than practicing as a rabbi, has actually been working in the tech field for a couple of decades. Um, and we also have um, Paul, who is a senior AI expert um, specializing in foundation models and large language models at Germany's Applied AI Initiative. So we're going to first see a short video um, that explains a little bit about the project, and then we're going to get into a little bit more um, detail. So if we could please uh, roll the video now, that would be great. Studying is an integral part of the Jewish faith. As part of our tradition, we annually read the same texts, delving into their meanings and the related analysis to deepen our understanding of both the text and our world. Beyond the core text of the Torah, there exists a vast array of books, commentaries, and both written and oral interpretations. However, locating specific themes across these extensive works can be challenging as there is no centralized thematic index and new content is continuously being developed. This is where we thought that AI could take studying to a whole new level. We use cutting edge retrieval augmented generation techniques in order to provide accurate answers, relevant links, and to find further documents to study. To move forward, we are going fast and slow. We want to ensure that state-of-the-art language modeling techniques are properly implemented that the answers and links are of such quality that we can release it to everyone. But at the same time, we want to develop an MVP, a minimum viable product, so that we can quickly associate many around the world to start using the platform to provide feedback and to deliver value. Additionally, we develop prompts that reflect and respect the views of reformed, conservative, and orthodox communities in order to consider the different views in Judaism. In less than four months, we have started our developments and welcomed over 50 users, including rabbis, scholars, and community members from Israel, Europe, and the U.S. who now regularly engage with it. We have named it Virtual Hevruda, drawing from the Hebrew word for friend and inspired by the rabbinical method of paired study. This project is a cooperation between Safaria, the largest provider of Jewish texts on an open source basis, Applied AI and the Software AI Venture Labs of the Technical University of Munich. Through this initiative, we aim to use artificial intelligence not only to enhance the study of Jewish texts, but to enrich the joy it brings. If you are interested in supporting this initiative, please consider making a donation here. Your contribution can help us expand beyond our successful pilot and bring artificial intelligence into synagogues for everyone. So, Antoine, let's start with you. Tell us about the genesis of this project. So, so it's pretty simple. Uh, Sam Altman visited uh, Europe and Munich in June, and I had a quick discussion with him on the, the respective value of focused large language model versus generalist one. And he asked me what was the use case which I had in mind, and I told him exactly what Jennifer had been describing, which was that when you study Torah, you have a core text, and then you've got a lot of multiple commentaries which are in multiple places, and that it's not so easy to identify the latest one, the relevant one, and this is something that would be a great fit for uh, creating a focused large language model and using the technology of AI. We, we exchanged a few mail, and, and I felt very encouraged, and then I reached out to a number of organizations. So I think I reached out to your husband to be able to talk to the uh, reform committee that I'm come from, but I also talk, spoke with uh, uh, people who are more conservative. And I currently, in Munich, I go to the Chabad, which is an orthodox community, and everyone was interested, which, as Jennifer said, nearly never happens. And then I reached out to two organizations uh, as I was encouraged. So one is Sefaya, which Lev will describe. And then at the university, we have one unbelievable secret weapon. There's an organization called Applied AI, which 
probably is Germany best AI capabilities and, and, and a center of expertise with 150 people. And I just had a casual discussion with uh, Andreas Sibels, the managing director, and Bernard Flegger, and, and, and they say that they have one part which is about that uh, is, is for non-profit uh, uh, initiatives on AI, and they wanted to help us, and we got the help from this guy who is absolutely ah. amazing, and that's, that's how we got started, easy. Thanks. So, Lev, uh, tell us why Safari decided to get involved. I mean, Safari has been amassing uh, a pile of Jewish texts for the past 10 years, um, doing all of the hard work of, we actually like take physical books, cut off the binding, scan them, do the OCR, um, or we buy them from <coughs> publishers, deal with the rights, effectively creating an open source trove of digital data. And we did this with the knowledge that we didn't know where technology was going to go, but we knew that it was going to be data hungry and that any future educational endeavor involving Jewish texts would need a huge trove of data. So we're, we're sitting on 350 million words of, of data, and when Antoine reached out to us and said, well, we'd love to pair you with experts in AI in order to bring, uh, bring the power of generative AI into this data set, it was just a natural yes. So, Paul, tell yes. us a little bit about, you know, how uh, this is a good test case yes. for the RAG technology. Yes, um, you know, large language models inherently they hallucinate. So um, actually, just in the past one year, uh, there has been so much like intensive uh, like discussion or development work uh, happening in the industry where people try to uh, tackle this issue. And one of the very promising issue, uh, solution there is the so-called RAG, as you said, retrieval augmented generation. Basically, that means that we try to uh, bring together what has been there in large language model, the intrinsic knowledge of large language models, uh, with, uh, together with uh, the external reliable facts that we could provide it. And the advantage of doing so is that in, uh, we could, in this way, we make it more traceable, more c controllable, and more like, explainable. So virtual Har Haruta turned out to be a really good case because at that time we were really having, uh, really thinking about uh, having a good use case preferably with open data, and it has to be very, very domain-specific. And uh, in this respect, Virtual Hubble has seen really uh, a nice case for us to work on. Thanks. So, Lev, not, it, again, it's a huge feat that this project has is managed to bring all three branches of Judaism together, which is unheard of. But not everyone is a fan. And so I, you know, I looked at an a Orthodox Jewish website called Torah Box, and the rabbi said, Chachi Shpi should be forbidden on any religious matters, um, and, and said this is because Chat GBT is an AI model and not a person, and so does not have free will, and is incapable of understanding or responding to spiritual question, and, and secondly, that, you know, Chat GPT is prone to error, and so could, you know, mi give, um, misguide people. So how do you answer these kind of criticisms? I mean, listen, you know, first off, I don't want to, I, you know, I don't want to um, pretend that, that a computer replaces a human, but it reminds me of, um, you know, something about having a long memory. You know, 500 years ago, uh, with, the, uh, with the printing press, there was the first, one of the first major works of, of Jewish text that was printed was called the Shulchan Aruch, the set table. And it was a law book that purported to uh, set out all of the laws. And there was huge pushback to this particular law book because every individual community had its own practices and, and you know, people would, were, were, were protesting. It, one, one person even wrote, why would I want a set table? I want my home-cooked food, you know. A, and uh, the, um, what happened was the, the commentary on the, the set table was interjected into the printing of, the, of this book in the second pressing. And then in further pressings, the third commentary and the fourth commentary were interjected into this book. And the book has remained 600 years late, 500, 600 years later, to be a seminal text that people still reference. So with the initial change of media, people protested, of course, but what 
ended up carrying the day were the people that hacked the media to their purposes, brought the conversation into it, and found a way to work with it. I don't think we're going to be able to keep the kids away from, 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 you know, from AI technology. We have to find a way to integrate it and make it work. So yeah. let me ask this question to all three panelists. What, what impact do you think this project is going to have? So if I, if I could start, one of the things that we notice at the, at the synagogue is that um, a lot of the kids which do their um, coming of age ceremony, the bar mitzvah, the bat mitzvah, after they tend to leave because they are busy, they, they have to studies and they have their families and they get a job, but they come back at f when they are around 40 years old. It's the same in every country and probably for every movement. So we have to find a way of facilitating them to come back and this is the sort of thing that uh, is going to be making that in maybe you know 30 years 20 years they will come back to Judaism and so Paul um, yes. <clears throat> what do you think the larger impact will be in terms of like testing the rag technology and 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 maybe um, helping people have more confidence in yes. uh, using AI yes I think uh, as I said there is a lot of technical complexities happening here. Maybe this project is like more demanding than other industrial projects that I have seen because in a way you want to make a factory correct, but you also want to make everything like inspiring enough so that it's like satisfactory and uh, providing satisfactory answers. So uh, in this respect, I think uh, it's a very good chance for us to actually uh, you know, explore uh, what has been there in this field and then try to advance yeah, all those techniques. And that has been actually the Applied AI's, uh, one of Applied AI's mission that is to uh, help people uh, like understand the trust, uh, like uh, how AI techniques could actually be helpful to them instead of replacing them. Because as can chatbots aid rabbis in the end. So Lev, I have to ask. I mean, Antoine outlined why it's important to um, put generative AI into the mix to help keep the Torah alive for generations to come. Mm -hmm. So. Will chatbots replace rabbis? <laughs> will will <laughs> chatbots replace rabbis? I, I don't think that I don't think that the the chatbot is going to replace um, you know the pastoral care that 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 a you know a therapist or 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 a clergy member can give, but but I do see that you know we we offer this this huge library of thousands of books and people they they slide right off the face of it and i have to imagine that that's true in the humanities in general someone going into philosophy someone you know looking for looking for wisdom in a work of literature uh, what we can do is we can help people find entry into the library. We can help people find the things that mean something to them personally within the books. And in that way it can, you know, facilitate someone's entry into works of wisdom in the way that a rabbi would. Yeah. Okay. And so last question, Antoine, what do you need to scale this project globally? So, so we have three major uh, strategic initiatives that uh, we have. The first one is that uh, we want to double the number of users. We want to better understand what is the value of the system. Just by the way, like what we advise the startup to do uh, to be able to really understand the value. And I can see a few faces of people who work with me, so I hope that it speaks to them. The second thing that uh, we want to do is that we want to extend the data. There's a ton of data which should be integrated and digitized. So we are discussing with uh, Lev and Paul on how to improve this. And then the third one is that, you know, it takes a lot of compute and funding to uh, run the system. Uh, the three of us, we have a day job, by the way, okay? <laughs> so um, we'd like to do uh, you, that you go to sefaria.org. There's a donate page. Can you please give us the ability to get more funding so that we can have this? And everyone who wants to join the, the the pilot right now, come and see us. Great, and with that, can I ask um, the audience to give a nice round of applause for, um, for our panel? Thank you and all very you. much. Thank you. Thank you.